Today's second scripture reading is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, verses 1 through 10, and it may sound a little bit familiar. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable, Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness, and go after the one that is lost until he finds it. When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous people who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, Sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it. When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Thank you, Barry. Would you join me in taking a moment of silent prayer and reflection uh, in memory of the 9-11 tragedy and the families uh, that continue to mourn the loss of their loved ones. In your mercy, gracious God, hear our prayers. Amen. I think if we took some time this morning to just sit together and share, each of us may have a a different story or a different memory of where we were and what was going on at the time that we heard about uh, the attacks in New York, specifically 9-11, and then throughout the day. Um, Katie was sharing... Uh, the very next day, uh, giving birth to her twins, Drew and Hannah. Um, At the time, on that day, I was working at Oakdale Emory United Methodist Church in Alney, Maryland, in Montgomery County. Pam was working on a project in Northern Virginia, very close to the Pentagon, and she was very, very pregnant with Nathan, who was born on October um, 10th. And uh, so I heard about the attacks, and then listening to the radio, you were hearing all sorts of chatter about a plane over the Potomac heading towards D.C., just all sorts of things going through. And if you remember, cell phone use was almost (laughs) nothing, and the only way I could get in touch with Pam that day while trying to drive down to Oakdale Emory was to just keep trying, just keep trying to get through. Um, and finally did get through, and I'm like, either you're coming home or I'm coming to get you. And then having uh, the employees from her work who had planned a shower for her to happen around that same time, convincing me that she's okay. And then she talks to me that night and talks about one of her um, fellow employees coming in and seeing the smoke coming up from the Pentagon. Um, And I was just thinking is the horror of it, not knowing the confusion and everything else, wondering what in the world is going on, and my wife carrying my child that it took us nine years to to make uh, was down in the midst in somewhere where I could not do anything. I remember the helpless feeling of that, and then getting to church. The church at Oakdale Emory had people that Uh, went to the church that worked at the Pentagon, and it also had people that worked at the World Trade Center. So I got to church 
with all my own emotions going on and all my own worries and cares and everything else, and then began the phone calls from youth who said, my parents, I can't get through to them. My dad's at the Pentagon. I don't know what's going on. My, my parents are at the World Trade Center. I don't know what's going on. And then it went into the mode of how do we care for people in the midst of crisis? And we opened up the church and the side chapel, the main sanctuary and everything else, and just invited people to come and to pray, to be there, just to have a space to be, to hug people, to cry with people, to just have a place to be. And we opened up every channel of communication we could to try and find out any information that we could from what was happening, to see if we could hear from loved ones or whatever. But we sat by people, we cried with people, we held their hand and walked through that journey. I'll never forget it because it lasted the week. It was each and every day that we were doing that type of thing. But I will say as we were listening for stories, the one thing that came out, some of the first images that I saw were police and firefighters running the opposite direction of everybody else into the midst of something that was completely chaotic. Where other people were running away, they were running in. And it was those images and those stories that I think really spoke to the hearts of so many. People saw that and then they were trying to figure out how can I respond? What can I do? And I remember seeing the the lines of people at Red Cross locations giving blood because they knew that that was going to be a necessary thing in the midst of that. But in the months to come, there were people going to their local fire stations and going to their police departments and going to different places, signing up, saying, I want to help. I want to help. What a great response that is in our human condition when we see tragedy, when we see crisis, when we see hurt, that there's something in us that tugs at us and says, I want to help. I want to do something. I want to make a difference. I want to offer hope and I want to offer healing. And it's with all this in mind that when we were preparing for today, it's why we wanted to celebrate our first responders. Because it's in the midst of those times, those tragedies, those crises, no matter how big or how small, that you guys are stepping into places that others don't have the training or the ability to do, even if they may want to, and you're there offering hope, and you're there offering healing, and you're there caring for members of the community, and sometimes even us. And for that, we thank you. But we also recognize that it's not just a job that you do, but something where God has tugged on your heart and said, this is what I want you to do. It's a calling. It's a mission. And it's a ministry. And we appreciate everything that you do. Our passages today speak to the heart of God that we also see reflected in the actions of our first responders. We look at Psalm 14. It's a psalm of lament. Uh, in fact, it's, it's a song because the very first part is talking to the choir director for exactly how to go about singing it, but it is a song of lament where he's saying that God must be looking down and looking around and seeing no one lifting up anything to God, no one praying, no one having anything good to do or to say or anything else, but then he noticed where God was, and he responds that God is with us, God is with and for his people even through calamity and suffering, and offers hope and restoration. In the very end, he recognizes that even with as they call it in there, the, the translation is fools. Even when the fools aren't looking to God and reaching up to God and looking for God in the midst of things, that God is still there and God is still present and God still has people there and that God is offering hope 
and God is offering restoration, and God is offering healing, even in the midst of tragedy, even in the midst of things not going right. We see that in our first responders and how they respond uh, to situations, offering that same hope, that same restoration, that same feeling. And then we have Luke 15. I love these parables. The parables of the lost sheep, the parables of the lost coin. How many of us would find ourselves in that situation? First of all, who would own 99 sheep? Anybody? Um, but if you had 99 sheep and you're trying to corral those 99 sheep, maybe the McGuckins, um, but, you know, um, but if you're trying to corral those and one gets away, are you really going to leave the rest of them and go after it? I have enough time chasing my dog down, but there's more to the story than that, and it's just like the lost coin, and I tell you what, they must have had celebrations all the time back in the day, you know, because it's, you know, you find the lost sheep, and then you call all your neighbors together and have a party. You find a lost coin, and then you call all your neighbors together and have a party. How many of you have parties every time you lose something and find it again? That would be pretty cool. We should start a tradition. That would be neat. We'd be getting together all the time. How many of you lose something almost on a daily basis? I'm telling you, we'd be party people. It'd be really neat, but... Um, what do we learn from this? And what do we learn from this from God? What are these parables about? These parables are about the heart of God. These parables tell us that even though it doesn't make sense in our own mind, God cares about us so much that he'd be willing to leave everything else behind to come and find us. That even if we're just one lost coin that God would scrounge around and do everything possible to come and find us, that God's love is so great for us that that matters and that God's going to come into the midst. One of the mantras I love about first responders is their desire that no one be left behind, that you go in and that no one is left behind, whether it's one of their fellow first responders, or whether it's the people they're going to serve, no one is left behind. Most of us thinking of a burning building or a situation that is dangerous don't think, yes, I want to run into that. But a first responder says, I have to. There's people that need help. And they go running into those situations and they help and they respond and they provide the need in that because they're recognizing that the one matters. That the one is important no matter what. So just like chasing after the one lost sheep or the one lost coin, they recognize that even though it may not make sense in other people's heads, every life matters. Every person matters, and that's why they train, and that's why when the bell goes off in the middle of the night, they jump up, get their uniform on as quickly as possible, and go. I remember when I was in the Coast Guard trying to sleep, and those 4, 4 a.m. sirens and the red light going off in the squad bay and everyone jumping out and throwing on everything we could and getting down to the boat as fast as we could, to go, and not once did I ever hear anybody complain, oh man, it's early. Do we really have to do this? No, there weren't any words. It was just get your gear on and go, and then find out where you're going and what you need to do, and getting everything, all the gear prepped and everything to make sure that you could do what you need to do when you were there. Because at that moment when the siren went off, all you knew is that there was someone in need and you were going to help. God has given us that heart. God has given each and every one of us a desire that no one should be left behind. What are ways we as a church can be a part of that? Maybe we're not a first responder. Maybe we don't have the training to run into a burning building or a dangerous situation and do something. But what are ways in which God has laid on our heart a, that idea that no one should be left behind? 
Who are the people we can reach out to? Who are the people that we can care about? And we've done it several times. The homeless gentleman, Dave, that came over the summer that we helped and cared for. No one was left behind there. When we have people that come that are in need, we provide for that need the best way that we can. And we need to find every opportunity that we can. Youth and children in their schools, seeing that kid that's sitting by themselves in the cafeteria, no one left behind. Caring for people when other people may not be very nice to them or caring for them at all. It's an opportunity for us to remember no one should be left behind. And caring for those people even in the midst of that. It's God laying on our hearts that no one should be left behind. It is such a wonderful day for us to be able to celebrate uh, the first responders from our community. The um, Precinct 7 of the Baltimore County Police Department and our retired member Beth uh, representing today. Um, the Baltimore County uh, Paid Fire Department and the, the Texas station that's close by, uh, that's Station 17. We also have the Jacksonville Volunteer Fire Company. Um, and when I was doing a little bit of research, I discovered a similarity between us and the Cockeysville Volunteer Fire Company, that we started our mission and our ministry roughly at the same time. Epworth was founded in 1893, and the Cockeysville Volunteer Fire Company was founded in 1896, so only three years apart. So we've been caring for the community together for a long time, and I hope that we continue to be able to find ways of doing that as we go forward. All of us here at Epworth do say thank you for all that you do to care for this community that we all love. We all share the same calling from God to leave no one behind and to share God's healing and hope for all people. As neighbors of first responders, police, fire crews, EMS, we at Epworth are going to strive to find ways in which we can do even more to care for and support all of you in the selfless work that you do. We value you and the care that you offer. And if there's anything we can do to be in support of you and the mission that you have, that is what we want to do. Because just like you love this community, so do we. And what better way of supporting but to work together to make that happen. So if we can partner with you in any way to care for you and your needs as you do your work, please let us know so we can be a part of that. We care about you. We care about this community. And God has called us to do all in our, our, our um, ability to care and to offer God's grace and healing and hope in the midst of everything here. So I wanted to take a moment as we begin to close to share the, uh, the devotion for today that's from the Strength for Service to God and Community book that we gave to our first responders. And this is for September 11th. It says, there are many amazing stories that have emerged from the aftermath of September 11th, 2001. Stories of bravery, self-sacrifice, and service above and beyond the call of duty, have risen from the ashes in New York City. As has been the custom of our nation throughout its history, we allowed triumph to come out of tragedy. One of the many we lost, one of the many who lost their lives that September day was a Franciscan friar named Michael F. Judge. He was 68 when he was killed by debris from the collapse of the towers. When first responders pulled the friar's body from the rubble, they found a small card in his pocket with words that had been known as Michael's prayer. Lord, take me where you want me to go. Let me meet who you want me to meet. Tell me what you want me to say and keep me out of your way. What better prayer could any of us pray on a daily basis? We need a prayer that both confesses submission and professes service to our creator. Your life is marked by a call of duty to your fellow human beings. Today, as you live and serve, think on Jesus' words of allowing him to become greater, while also, 
while also whispering this prayer that was pulled from the rubble of 9-11. As I read that devotion and read Michael's prayer, it reminded me of a prayer that's a part of our Methodist heritage known as the Wesley Covenant Prayer. See if you notice similarities. This is something that Wesley prayed every morning at 4 a.m. upon waking up on his knees. He would pray, I am no longer my own, but thine. Put me to what thou wilt. Rank me with whom thou wilt. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be employed for thee or laid aside for thee. Exalted for thee or brought low for thee. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all things to thy pleasure and disposal. And now, O glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thou art mine, and I am thine. So be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Amen. What a great prayer. It puts everything into perspective. This life isn't about only us. This life is about what we are going to do with it, what God has gifted us with, and how we are going to use it to care for others, to care for God's creation, to care for everything that God has given breath. And it puts God first. Maybe we all need to begin praying Michael's prayer or praying Wesley's covenant prayer and reminding ourselves on a daily basis and asking God to lead us, to guide us, to hand ourselves over to God and say, use me. As you go into this week, as you continue throughout the day, just pray to God, use me, Lord. Help me to be in your will. Help me to do your work. Help me to care for your creation. And we'll join with our friends of the first, re the friends first responders in caring for the community uh, in the way that God has called each and every one of us to. Amen? Amen.